Welcome to the 15 minute forum on exploring generative AI for faculty. Uh, this is labeled as a 15 minute forum, but I imagine it's going to go a little bit over because we've got a lot of content to go through, so I do apologize for that. But the idea of this session is that we're going to try and give faculty an introduction to this AI technology, specifically generative AI. Uh, we've had a lot of developments lately. And I just want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable at an introduction level. So if you're up and flying with AI, this may not be the presentation for you. But what we're going to try and do is to produce a framework that you can follow. So as new tools come and are introduced, you can start to explore them with a bit more comfort and a bit more confidence. While the development of general artificial intelligence has been a goal and a dream, I suppose, for computer scientists for centuries, the recent breakthroughs in large language models, or LLMs, has seen an incredible adoption and the quick integration with major companies has seen it in our laps, in our classrooms, a lot more quickly than we would have anticipated. Actually they're saying this a lot more prevalent than even uh, the introduction of mobile phones which we all know has had a huge impact in our classrooms. So as I mentioned the main focus of this presentation is to look for opportunities for faculty to try and leverage this amazing technology and ultimately to try and save time. These AI tools can be teaching assistants for educators. They could also reduce administrative tasks and allow us to focus on those individual needs of students and basically get back to the thing that we all love about teaching. I want to preface this presentation with the ideology that we're trying to look to utilize these tools so that we can enhance our human connection and pursue activities that we love about being teachers. Like when you learn any new skill or when you are introduced to any new technology, there's always going to be a learning curve. So as you're introduced to something new, your performance is always going to drop. And then often you feel like you may be spending more time with this new fast solution than you would have with your previous more manual workflow. However, as you start to build your confidence, you're gonna to start to see the, the benefits of your efforts. And while we progress through these stages, you also find that you require different levels of support. So I wanna encourage you to reach out to your colleagues, your divisional tech coaches, and even your, your leaders within your department to ensure that as you go through these different stage, stages that you're supported in the different ways which are appropriate as you start to integrate the technology. Okay, so let's get into the bulk of this presentation. This presentation can be divided into four different parts. So first of all, Graham Nolan, who is our computer science teacher in the high school, will be explaining to you the fundamental knowledge for this technology. So the things you need to understand about how this technology works and also what some of the current limitations are. I'm then going to step you through some useful examples of how you could integrate these tools with your current administrative work as a, as a faculty member. And then we're going to define some of the AI expectations to help you manage the technology within your classroom. And then finally, we're going to explore ways which we can encourage the productive use of AI integration. So as I mentioned, this will be a high level overview of these topics and I hope that throughout the year we can dive deep into each of these headings. Uh, but in the meantime, we hope that this is a presentation which will allow you to start to begin to see AI tools as an aid for your work. So first of all, we're going to allow Graham to explain to you the fundamentals of this technology. And as I mentioned to you, Graham is our computer science teacher in the high school. And actually in our data science and machine learning courses, we actually teach students how to create their own neural networks, which are similar to the, the structure of the large language models, which he's going to explain to you. To better understand our students' interactions with AI tools and provide them with the necessary guidance, it is crucial for us as educators to first familiarize ourselves with these tools and their underlying mechanisms. Here, we will provide a concise introduction to large language models, such as ChatGPT, and explain how they function in the context of education. Alan Turing, who is one of the founding researchers in the field of AI, once said, a computer would deserve to be called intelligent if it could deceive a human being into believing that it was human. This statement is the premise of the Turing test, a method for determining whether a computer can think like a human being that is still widely regarded as the benchmark for true artificial intelligence. This quote is particularly interesting for our discussion because it captures the essence of what AI aspires to achieve, especially in the context of generative AI like ChatGPT. Turing's vision has been a driving force behind the development of AI technology that aims to mimic human intelligence communication and problem solving abilities. As educators, understanding the roots of AI and the goals set by visionaries like Turing can help us better appreciate the potential of these tools in our classrooms, while also being aware of the challenges and limitations they present. 
By now, we have all heard of ChatGPT, which was released in November 2022 and has since become synonymous with AI. This remarkable tool has the ability to respond to natural language inquiries in a manner that is almost indistinguishable from human responses. It can quickly synthesize extensive and intricate information with impressive accuracy and relevance to the posed question. However, it's crucial to emphasize that while powerful, these AI tools are not infallible. They have the potential to confidently present misinformation or make errors that could lead to significant consequences. As educators, it's our responsibility to be mindful of these limitations when employing these tools in our teaching practice. Moreover, it's essential that we educate our students on the importance of critically evaluating information generated by AI tools, as their reliability cannot always be guaranteed. So how is ChatGPT so powerful? It's based on a large language model, which is a type of generative machine learning. The earliest public release of ChatGPT, which is version 3.5, was trained on an enormous 570 gigabyte corpus of books, academic papers, and articles over a period of 1.5 years. It derives its responses from a staggering 175 billion parameters. We'll explore what these numbers mean as we go along. You may have heard of machine learning. It's a field of study that involves specialized mathematical algorithms called models. These models can be trained to recognize patterns and make predictions based on previously seen data. ChatGPT is one such model, and it is based on a specific type of model called a neural network. Neural networks are a type of machine learning model inspired by the structure and function of the human brain. They consist of interconnected layers of virtual neurons that calculate a numerical output based on the weighted inputs from the previous layer of neurons. The final layer's output is the model's prediction. Neural networks can be applied to a wide range of tasks, including language understanding and image recognition. Neural networks learn through a process of trial and error, during which their understanding of a problem is encoded in the weights for each of the connections between neurons. During training, the network reads input predicts output, compares it with the expected output, adjusts the weights accordingly, and repeats the process millions of times. The weights are determined automatically by the model's algorithm. The inner workings of a neural network are highly complex, making it often difficult to understand how they make predictions. Here you can see a visual of the features a neural network looks for when trying to identify animals. Notice that they are very different from features such as eyes, ears and nose that we might look for. So we can understand how neural networks work and how they're trained and we also know that they make good predictions. However, it's very difficult to explain what the connections and weights between neurons mean in every prediction. In other words, we can't easily understand how they reason. As a result, neural networks are often referred to as black box models. They can make highly accurate predictions, but it's difficult to understand how they arrive at those predictions. This lack of interpretability poses a challenge in some applications where we need to understand why the model made a particular decision or identify biases in the model's output, such as trying to determine how a model denied a loan or decided to approve a credit card application. Generative AI, like ChatGPT, creates new information based on a prompt which can be a question, statement, or even an image. This information is fed into a neural network as numbers, which then performs billions of calculations to generate a numerical output that is interpreted back into the desired format, such as an image or as text. So essentially, each word in ChatGPT's response is a prediction of what should come next based on the previous words in the input and its previous response to a prompt. It does not access any external data sources, but rather generates its output solely based on the patterns and associations it learned during its training. What this means is that generative models produce unique output based on their innate understanding, much like a human would responding to a general knowledge question. This makes it increasingly difficult to distinguish between text generated by machines and text written by humans. While AI tools can measure the likelihood that text was generated by AI, it's not always foolproof. As these models continue to improve, the question arises of whether we are better off modeling responsible use of this technology than fighting the potentially losing battle of trying to detect its use.
Thanks very much, Graham. So now that you have some fundamental knowledge of the technology and how it works, in this section we're going to begin to explore how we can integrate this technology into our roles as educators. And I hope that through this, once you have a, an understanding of how you could use it for your own job, it'll then allow you to, to start to think about how this could be useful for our students and the skills that we want to develop for them for the future. So AI can have many benefits in education, such as saving time, as I mentioned before, but also in fee improving the feedback for students and enhancing learning. But how can we integrate technology into our teaching practices and our daily workflows? So for demonstration purposes for this presentation, I'm going to be using to what Microsoft refers to as New Bing. And this is accessible to all of our faculty using our same username and password using the Edge browser. So if you install this on your Mac OS laptop, or you can install the Bing app on your phone or iPad, this will give you access to the technology. While there may be more powerful solutions out there or other products which are, are available, I've chosen this solution just simply because we are aware where Microsoft's uh, policies are on retention of data. We also know that this technology is free and available within Hong Kong, uh, which means we don't need to use a VPN to try and bypass any restrictions. And of course, the examples that I'm presenting could also be done in BARD or, or PO or OpenAI's ChatGPT. But this is just the simplest option for what we have freely available to us at the moment in Hong Kong. A big hurdle in adopting any kind of new technology is that it's always difficult to uh, know what questions to ask uh, when you don't have an underlying understanding. So I hope this first section that Graham presented will help. Uh, but then as we go through, and I can show you these integrations, these will show you a couple of ideas that you can uh, try out for yourself. And hopefully you feel a little bit more confident in exploring more for yourselves and also then asking some more direct follow-up questions. The technology is definitely worth investing some time to become familiar with. It's not something that I believe you can you can put your head in the sand. It's not a you know the next smart board. And as time goes on, uh, these integrations become more and more uh, profound. They become more and more accurate in their responses as time goes on. As you've heard, the nature of this technology is that it's always self-improving. So any doubts that you may have in the accuracy of the outputs or the responses. I'm sure the developers have the exact same doubts as well and they're going to be quickly rectified as these models continually train, as they continually uh, self-improve on them. In the latest version of GPT-4, all of the AI models which are now integrated have limited access to the internet. So while those models are self-contained, they can now use the internet to reflect on their responses before giving you the response. So this means a lot of those hallucinations, as they were called, that these AI models were producing, there's now been a huge reduction in those. So we can now rely a lot more on the, the facts that these models are actually producing. So what this means is by structuring our prompts to encourage the AI to reflect, we can actually dramatically improve the responses that were given. This is very similar, I suppose, to the way you would structure a question if you're encouraging a student to have a deeper level of thinking when they want to respond. You should also think of the AI tool as a collaborative partner, and you shouldn't expect that if you're going to put in a single prompt or a one-shot prompt, that you're going to get the correct response every time. So think of it similar to if you were to approach a graphic designer to create a logo for you or, or something like that. It's unlikely that when they come back to you with the first level of revisions, that they're going to be able to extract all the information that was in your head or all your thoughts just in that single design brief. You'll need to do a collaborative process with them to go back and forth to get exactly what you need. So think of AI in that terms as well. If you just give a single line prompt, you're not going to get the, the same level of detail or the same response that you may expect. This PREP acronym can be used to help structure your prompts by giving the AI a persona, allowing them to contextualize what you're trying to do with examples, setting the level of expectations, and then asking it to use its logic by using uh, a phrase such as, let's step out your logic, or let's think this through step by step. This will encourage the AI to think about it logically and think about those training sources, perhaps, which were step by step in order to give a solution for you. So you'll find quickly when you're using any of these sort of chatbot AIs that there is a limit on the input. So for example, I couldn't take uh, a whole book of Animal Farm, as I've done in this example, and copy and paste it into the chat room 
and have it um, just summarize. However, if we use a tool like the Edge browser, which is also a PDF reader, we could right click on the file, open up our digital text, and then use the new Bing chatbot window to query or analyze the text within it. So here what I've done is open up the book of Animal Farm, which is the, the multiple chapters, which was freely available. From there, I was able to summarize and do an analysis and create some definitions for students on character analysis based on the text. So I gave contextual understanding to the AI model of the book. I can't just say, uh, do you remember Animal Farm? Because that may not be a corpus uh, of text which it was trained on. However, I now have the contextualized understanding along with the language model. So currently the application of these AI models do not give us access for long-term memory, but I'm sure that's not too far off. But now I have done my original query where I asked it to analyze the text for chapter two. I now have that context so I can begin to develop a little bit more of this unit of work around that chapter. So if this was a new unit of work for you, perhaps you might use GPT to develop what an, an exhibiting depth response might be to a task or what uh, a developing task might be might look like as you start to develop them out. Because without that student idea, you might think that perhaps a 500 word limit might be enough for the students to uh, respond personally on their reflection of this chapter, but it may not be enough until you actually read their responses. So of course this is going to take some back and forth, as I mentioned before, uh, to get exactly what you're trying to get. But it's unlikely that the chatbot will ever be able to create a, a perfect response for you unless you're very, very explicit with the prompt that you've given it. Since the chatbot may not know the academic levels that you're looking for, you could modify your prompt as if it was written for a young student. So giving it that persona of a young student, it could allow you to, for example, uh, have a developing response. So if I was teaching this course at grade 10, perhaps I could say, respond to this prompt as if you were a seventh grade student. And that would be the literacy level of developing, for example. Now I'm not too sure on the ELA standards, but that's just an example of how you can manipulate the model to give a lower understanding or a lower level of response. So now that your new unit has an assessment and some sort of example of a student response, we can ask the chatbot to create a rubric for the task. So remember that you need to be as specific as possible. Uh, establish your reporting taxonomy to ensure that it includes the measurement topics which you required. So as we go through this, um, it'd be very difficult for you to input a table because it only allows text. So just putting it in dot points in a hierarchical fashion will allow you to, to easily prompt the, the chatbot. Of course, you'll need to proofread and check for any hallucinations which may appear, but I think you'll be surprised at how close it gets and how much work it'll actually save you so you can just tailor the responses and do the wordsmithing as you need to. If you have any examples of previous rubrics that you've created um, or it has the style of writing that you previously used for your uh, subject discipline, this could also greatly improve the accuracy as well, or at least give you something that you're, you're accustomed to or something which you would write yourself. So giving those additional context, giving that additional example will also increase the accuracy and also give you a favorable response. To support your students further, you may wish to create a checklist or a how-to guide to give them an idea of how to structure their research or provide the response in a format that would be uh, to your liking. So since we will be using a fairly large output from your AI, you may wish to explore the export feature, which will allow you to export your response to a Word document or a text file, which you could easily upload to Schoology, or you can tweak within your, within your own liking. So if you wanted to add you know, colors and, and text and all those sort of things, which make it a bit more approachable for students, it's much easier within a format where you can edit rather than copying and pasting. And finally, let's look at some feedback and grading. We all know that the best feedback is regular and timely, which can be difficult on a full teaching load. And of course, it's very important that you grade your own students' work manually so that you can gauge the levels of understanding. However, if a student requires midway feedback, it could be very useful to see uh, what feedback the AI would give the students, and then you can see how they responded to that feedback in their final submission. 
Alternatively, you could actually encourage the students to do this part themselves, and then you could see how they're responding to their feedback or how they're improving their writing based on the midway point of submission and where it is in the final stance. Again, these are some very quick ideas about how you can utilize the technology. I encourage everyone to reach out to your divisional technology coaches to help engineer some prompts that will work for you within your context and learning area. I think the next section is probably the most contentious for faculty. We know that students have access to this technology and are already using it. And we also know that the updates are happening so quickly that it's difficult for us to update our academic tasks or assessments in order to keep ahead of the technology and ensure that we're maintaining academic integrity. Now unfortunately I don't have all of the answers for faculty or any sort of magic bullet that's going to improve the situation, uh, but I hope that having a better understanding of the fundamentals of this technology, we can begin to establish some clear expectations for our students in the classroom and start to ad adapt our existing policies to ensure that we are inclusive of this new technology. At HKS, we're currently in the process of developing our school-wide expectations for the use of AI, which is due to be communicated in the new academic year. However, for now, our students we know are already using the technology, the technology is already here, and we won't be attempting to block it at HKS. And our students are already using it, so how do we manage this within our classroom? I suppose that's the, the big question which we want to, to answer here. My biggest piece of advice, I suppose, would be to engage in a dialogue with your students around the use of this technology. Many of the students feel like as soon as they are using this technology that they're, they're committing some sort of academic misconduct, and it's not always the case if they're using it in a collaborative way. So a good way to think of this technology is to think if they were to get someone else to do the work, a physical person to do that work for them. So for example, would you ask a friend to write your essay for you? No, you probably wouldn't, so that would be a, a, a academic misconduct. Would you have your, your tutor create a complete outline for you before you respond? Would you ask your teacher to rewrite an entire paragraph or would you get them to give you feedback on it? So those sort of discussions with students will help guide the academic misconduct, help guide our policies and also allow us to engage in a dialogue with students so we can better understand their usage and how we can support them as they start to understand this technology and how they can use it. Remember that high school is a safe space for students to, to make mistakes, to grow. So as they move into the adult world, as they move into universities where there's more serious uh, applications for academic misconduct or, or repercussions for academic misconduct, they can understand how they can use this effectively to improve their learning. We use a comprehensive standards-based curriculum that aims to help students develop deeper understanding of key concepts and skills. One way that we can do this is by guiding students through a non-linear design process where we can utilize generative AI tools to generate ideas, content and data such as text, images, music or even code. These generative AI tools can en enable students to engage in inquiry-based learning where they can ask questions, investigate topics, analyze outputs and communicate their results with real-time responses. Engaging in inquiry is a part of our educational philosophy and the curriculum team will be continuing work surrounding the HKS inquiry model further in the next academic year. Through inquiry-based learning, students can develop critical thinking, creativity, collaboration and communication skills that are essential for the future. In this final section, we're going to look at the models and frameworks that are available to us so we can encourage further productive AI integration for the benefit of our students. Ultimately, it's up to us as educators at the coalface to model and promote the effective, ethical and productive interactions with AI inside the classroom. As we know, monkey see, monkey do. So by showing and discussing with students and our colleagues the effective use of technology, we can strengthen the productive use of generative AI tools. This section is definitely something that we're going to unpack a lot more in the new academic year. However, as we work towards clear expectations for the use of AI in our classrooms, we can look to the ISTE standards for educators as a guide. These standards provide a framework for safe, ethical, and effective use of digital tools in education, specifically the standards on being a responsible digital citizen and a thoughtful designer of learning activities aligned with our goals for AI usage. By following these standards and mentoring our students in a safe and ethical practices with digital tools, we can ensure that the use of AI is both effective and responsible. 
Let's work together to create positive, socially responsible contributions and build a community of learners that value the ethical use of technology and in particular, effective use of AI generative technologies. There are well-established models for the integration of technology and these can be easily utilized to reflect our use of generative AI tools. The technology integration matrix provides a framework for describing and targeting the use of technology to enhance learning based on characteristics of meaningful learning environments. For example, active, collaborative, constructive, authentic, and goal-directed. The TPAC framework describes the interplay of three types of knowledge that teachers need to effectively integrate technology, the technological, pedagogical, and content knowledge. And finally, the SAMR model categorizes four levels of technology integration, substitution, augmentation, modification, and finally, redefinition. These models are well established, and by using these frameworks, faculty can access their current level of technology integration and identify areas for improvement. They can align technology choices with their learning objectives and content standards. They can select appropriate generative AI tools that match their pedagogical strategies and also the student needs. They can design learning activities that leverage the potential of generative AI tools and create content or even data from scratch. And finally, we can also evaluate the impact of generative AI tools on student learning outcomes and engagement. I hope this presentation has given you a good overview over the potential of generative AI tools, and I look forward to engaging in more of this work with you throughout the new academic year.